Welcome to chapter 12. Chapter 12 is all about viruses, which are one of my favorite topics. Um, viruses are different than the rest of the things we've been talking about. Uh, they are not living, they rely on host cells to replicate, and they're pretty much just uh, genetic material and protein that makes them up. But uh, on the other hand, they still respond to some of the rules that we've talked about. They evolve through natural selection, but they're not alive. So they're this weird intermediate, um, and that makes them fascinating in many ways. We're just going to scrape the surface on viruses. There is so much to talk about here. The whole field of virology is out there. Uh, if you are really interested in viruses, there is a whole podcast called This Week in Virology um, that I listen to as an undergrad and still occasionally tune into. Um, it is fantastic. It can be uh, quite technical, but they have some very early podcasts on viruses uh, and how they're classified and things like that. So if you're really into it, that is out there. That's a cool resource for you. So we're going to talk all about um, how viruses differ from cells and what they're made up of. We will talk a little bit about how we classify viruses. I'm not going to ask you to memorize these classifications, but understanding what we use to classify them is important. We'll talk about how we culture viruses in the lab, which makes them difficult to work with. And uh, we'll talk about the replication cycles and um, some of the symptoms and things like that of a couple of human viruses. We'll talk about papillomaviruses, influenza viruses, and the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. These are each different classes of viruses. So we'll cover them differently. They do different things and um, interact with the body in different ways. Let's start with a case study. So we have Christine, she's 25. She's a critical care nurse um, at a hospital and she accidentally stuck herself with a needle while attempting to draw blood from a patient who is chronically infected with hepatitis C. So this is a very scary situation. Uh, sharps are uh, dangerous and it can lead to accidental needle sticks. So. Um, in this case, six weeks after the injury, uh, she experienced a fever and other flu-like symptoms. Because of what happened, they suspect that she has a hepatitis C infection of the liver now. So they're going to test her. Um, they test her liver function, um, and the levels fluctuate, and they're going to look at uh, what are called blood titers of the virus, which is basically how many viral particles are in the blood. Those go up and down as well. They're going to prescribe treatment. And this treatment is not something you can be on long term. Um, she's on ribavirin and pegylated interferon alpha. Um, so this is an RNA synthesis inhibitor. And this is a protein which helps boost the immune system. So hepatitis uh, is a virus that infects the liver. Uh, you can see here a healthy liver, and this is one that has viral cirrhosis. So cirrhosis is degradation of the liver. It can be caused by many uh, issues. One of them is hepatitis, and there are several different hepatitis viruses. This is not a fake case study. This has happened probably multiple times, um, but there are uh, several documented cases of accidental needle sticks leading to infection with uh, hepatitis. So you're going to keep monitoring her, and viral levels uh, continue to decrease to really, really low levels. Um, so they can use RNA from her blood and do a PCR test on that, and uh, her virus levels are dropping, but the side effects of the drugs that she's on are rather great. And this is a theme we will see over and over again in the um, talking about viruses. There are very few antiviral medications, and they often have strong side effects because viruses use our cellular machinery to reproduce. So uh, to stop that from happening, we generally have to interfere with our own cells. So they're going to take her off the therapy uh, because the side effects are greater than the effects of having the virus. 
So she's fine for 10 years. Her immune system keeps her the virus under control. But 10 years later, uh, she experiences an unexplained fever. Because of her medical history, they're going to test her blood, and we find that hepatitis C viral RNA is high again. She's again put on interferon and ribavirin, but again, the side effects are severe, um, and the drugs are less effective than they were before. So over the next 15 years, her liver function starts to decline, the organ starts to show indications of cirrhosis, and... Um, Luckily for her, she learns that there are two new antiviral drugs um, that can help stabilize her liver function until they find a donor. Uh, this is a problem, right? Uh, the liver function is never going to come back. She is at some point going to need a liver transplant. Um, also, these drugs, because they're new, they are very expensive. This is one of the problems. Uh, to conduct the process of medical research, it is very expensive, and the people who do that are generally very well qualified and expect to be compensated well for their work. Um, but on the other hand, uh, should we charge people exorbitant fees to save their lives? This is a question that I don't have an answer to, and I don't think as a society we've come to a reasonable answer yet. It's a back and forth. Um, we want to pay our healthcare workers, um, and we want to pay them well because they do very difficult jobs, but who is going to do that paying is a big question. So in this case, um, hepatitis C, let's talk a little bit more about the virus itself. Um, hepatitis, there are several different strains of the virus, um, and hepatitis... Uh, itself is kind of a, a generalized term for liver inflammation, um, but hepatitis virus can cause this. Um, it is non-cellular, like all viruses, so it doesn't it doesn't have a cell. Its genome is packaged up in a little capsid, which is a protein coat. Um, and the way the virus works is it moves into a cell, it tricks its way into a cell, and it takes over the cellular processes to make copies of itself and to reproduce, and then it releases itself, generally destroying the cell. It tends to do this in the liver tissue, which is why that cirrhosis occurs. Uh, hepatitis C virus is an RNA virus, so its genome is made up of RNA. There are other viruses that have DNA genomes. We will look at this uh, in great detail in a moment. Hepatitis C is a chronic issue worldwide. There are 60 million people who are chronically infected. About 15% of people who are infected actually will completely clear the virus and live virus-free for the rest of their life. That means that what, 85% uh, will not. So this is a bit of chance, uh, how much viral load you got and how strong your immune system is, but also a bit of luck in there. Because it's an RNA virus, it generally has a higher mutation rate than DNA viruses. Um, to treat it, we have to use multi-drug therapies where you're giving two or three drugs at the same time to keep the its ability to evolve resistance uh, lower. Um, if you just give one drug, most viruses can evolve resistance very, very quickly. Uh, if you give two drugs, the chance that they're going to evolve resistance to both of them at the same time is much lower. Three drugs, it's even lower, but... There are so many viral particles, there are so many viral replications that eventually they will evolve resistance. But antiviral drugs have huge amounts of side effects. Uh, they generally target your own body systems, which the viruses are hijacking. So uh, we basically uh, shut down parts of our body or part of our cell functions uh, to keep the virus from replicating. Uh, and we do that as long as we can until the side effects build up. Um, so like ribavirin can inhibit red blood cell function, and that's going to reduce the amount of oxygen you can carry, and there's going to be lots of side effects there. Uh, we'll talk about some drugs. Ribavirin uh, is an RNA analog, as we call it. It looks like an RNA base, but it screws up RNA replication, stopping this RNA virus from making copies of itself. So this is a scary example 
Uh, but um, it is not in any way uncommon, I would say, uh, for accidental needle sticks to lead to infections. Hopefully, it's not with something that's going to stick with you for the rest of your life, potentially, but it can be. So um, working with sharps is a, a very important skill to know how to do. So we're going to talk about uh, the process of viral infection and viral genomes first. Then we will dive into the structure of viruses in the next section. So we're going to talk about how viruses infect cells and can cause disease. Uh, define a couple of uh, terms, transmission, tissue tropism, and host range. And then we'll talk about the different classes of viral genomes and see how we organize different virus groups. Viruses are ubiquitous. They are everywhere. We have viruses that infect every taxonomic group of organisms, uh, viruses that infect bacteria, viruses that infect eukaryotes, viruses that infect archaea. Um, so viruses are out there. They are constantly evolving to be able to infect organisms. There are many important human diseases like influenza and the common cold that are caused by viruses. I would also put into this COVID-19 is a disease that is caused by a virus. We've all been affected by that. There are some viruses that can cause cancers or lead to cancers. This is because they can actually integrate their genome into our own and they switch on and break genes in various ways, which can lead to cancers. So this is really the only form of infectious cancer. And we'll talk about a specific example of this. Um, in the natural environment, viruses, um, are important. They often um, limit population sizes and things like this, but uh, they are complex to, to understand their, their impacts on these systems. So uh, we do often see viruses uh, that are out there um, and viruses obey the laws of natural selection too, even though they're not living. Um, and oftentimes that's very, uh, closely related with how they affect their host. Some viruses will kill their host. Some viruses don't kill their host. Uh, these are all forces that are worked on by evolution and natural selection. We're not really going to get into those topics, but they are fascinating to talk about if you pursue uh, these topics further. One prerequisite that all viruses need is a host cell. Viruses cannot replicate on their own, which is why we say they are non-living. They are not made of cells. That's the other reason they're not living. Uh, so in, in your body, there are viruses at all times. We have uh, bacteriophages that infect bacteria in your gut. When a phage gets into a bacteria, it injects its genome in there, and it hijacks the cell to start making copies of itself. Uh, we call a viral particle a virion. Um, these are the completed viral particles. So the genome gets in and it tricks the cell into making complete virions there. Uh, in the lab, we can observe and grow phages by using a lawn plate. So we've made these before in the lab. Uh, the white part here is bacterial growth. So this is a spread plate that's been grown into a lawn. And in here are bacteriophages that are causing what are called plaques. These little uh, darker splotches are where bacterial cells have been killed by viral particles, which uh, generally, when they replicate, they burst the cell, killing it. So these plaques are where we know the viral particles are. Because viruses need a host cell to replicate, that makes working with them very tricky. Um, so these bacteriophages, you can do the plaque assay. But if you want to work with a human virus, you need human cells to grow it in. And doing human cell culture is much more difficult than growing bacteria on a plate. An example of a human micro... An example of a human virus could be something like the measles virus. Uh, measles uh, was almost eradicated. Uh, it was at very, very low levels, but recently cases of measles have been on the rise, usually due to low vaccination levels. Uh, 
So we are seeing children experiencing the measles much more often. Um, measles virus is a special type of virus that's called enveloped. It actually takes some of the host cell membrane uh, as the viral particle exits, which can allow it to sneak by the immune system, making it difficult for our bodies to deal with. Um, we will talk about measles and its implications to kind of uh, epidemiology and human health uh, later in this course. So there are many, many other human viruses, right? And there's viruses that affect plants. Um, uh, tobacco mosaic virus is a big one that affects things like tomatoes and tobacco plants as well. Um, and it can cause spots on the leaves and things like that, and lead to lower crop yields. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, another interesting virus, uh, the Tasmanian devil actually can get infected with a virus that can cause cancers on its face and that prevents it from feeding. So there's a huge crisis with those animals right now. That's just another example. All viruses uh, have specific limits on what they, what they will infect. So we need to define a few processes first. Uh, viruses, by definition, have to be transmissible, uh, otherwise they will die out, right? They need to be able to transmit from uh, one host to another. Something like measles is transmitted through respiratory droplets, uh, HIV through blood or sexual reproductive fluids, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is transmitted by respiratory droplets. So uh, wearing something like a face covering can prevent these droplets from transferring from one individual to another. This process of transmission is critical for viruses to continue to spread. Viruses generally have a specific host range. This is the variety of species that a virus can infect. Uh, there are some viruses that will only infect one species. Something like uh, HIV is very specific to humans. Uh, there, uh, it, It's really only found in humans. Uh, there is a related virus. SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus, that infects uh, other primates. So uh, some viruses are very specific. There are others um, that can infect uh, broad groups. Uh, things like influenza can infect multiple uh, organisms. They can infect pigs, humans, birds, uh, many other things, ferrets, um, stuff like that. So the host range is really critical. This is where we talked about zoonoses previously. This is where new uh, viral diseases can come from. When we come into contact with other uh, organisms that are infected with viruses, if the host range is shared between that animal and us, uh, the virus can infect us from that animal. Tissue tropism is our other term. So viruses have to infect cells. And in animals, there are different tissue cells. You have lung tissue, you have uh, brain tissue, you have muscle tissues, right, skin, um, so on and so forth, all the different tissues. You can learn all the different tissues in anatomy and physiology. But many viruses have very specific tissue tropism, we call it. They can only infect certain tissues in the body. SARS-CoV-2, let's take that example. It infects respiratory tissue. You cannot get infected in your skin with COVID, SARS-CoV-2, right? Um, it infects respiratory tissue. This generally has to do with the way that the virus tricks its way into the cell. Certain cells will have receptors on their surface. Most viruses trick these receptors and convince the cell to bring it in. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, it is the ACE2 receptor um, that is generally only found in uh, lung tissue. Although there are some other organs that, that may have these. But um, something like HIV specifically infects uh, um, immune cells. So uh, other things, hepatitis, that's infecting the liver cells. Many viruses have specific tissues that they infect. So viruses have to replicate inside of a host cell. Uh, here's influenza virus. The first thing it has to do is trick its way into the cell. Once it gets in, it releases its genome, which then directs the cell to start making copies of the virus. And eventually the virus will uh, be released from the cell. That could destroy the cell. It could just butt off. Because the virus is using 
uh, our cellular machinery. Their genomes can be very small. Virus genomes are generally really, really small, and they only encode a few genes, a few proteins that basically uh, go out and hijack all the things in our cell. They hijack our metabolism, our DNA or RNA replication, uh, protein synthesis. So that has huge implications on treating viruses. Because there are very few things in a virus, there's very few things to target. And because the viruses are utilizing our own cells to do a lot of their replication processes, antiviral agents are going to have severe side effects because they're basically going to target something that our cell naturally does, and that's going to have off-target effects. The other problem is that viral genomes tend to mutate faster, even faster than bacterial genomes. Uh, this, and coupled with the fact that so many viral particles get made, this leads to rapid evolution, which can evade our immune system and evade our vaccination strategies and evade our antiviral drugs. So uh, think about COVID-19 pandemic. It took almost a year to get uh, some really good uh, antivirals. Uh, found. And even then, they were generally reserved for people who uh, were uh, in dire need of them, the elderly, basically, because we don't want to overuse our antiviral agents and possibly introduce uh, selection that will choose for resistant viral particles. So um, antivirals, very difficult to deal with. We'll talk about this a lot in the HIV section. A viral genome can be made up of either DNA or RNA. This depends on the viral species. Um, classifying viruses is weird. Uh, the genome can also either be double-stranded or single-stranded. So it could be double-stranded DNA or double-stranded RNA, which is a little weird. We haven't talked about that before, but it is theoretically possible. Or they could be single-stranded RNA. Um, this genome is generally how we classify them, and I will show you that in a moment. The genome is uh, encapsulated by this thing called a capsid, which is a set of proteins that uh, basically house the viral genome. In some viral species, they also coat themselves in an envelope, which comes from uh, the host membrane. So as they leave the cell, they take some host membrane with it. Uh, this might have viral proteins like spike proteins embedded in it. So the way we classify viruses is uh, generally called the Baltimore model, um, named for David Baltimore, who, who developed this method. Uh, it looks at the genome composition. Is it RNA or DNA? It looks at, is the genome single-stranded or double-stranded? And if it's single-stranded, is that strand directly coding for proteins, or is it the negative strand that uh, needs to be complemented before it can code for proteins? So here's the Baltimore model. Uh, we have group one, which is double-stranded DNA viruses, things like herpes viruses. Those can go in and be converted directly to mRNA. Single-stranded DNA viruses, like parvoviruses, um, uh, these need to be first converted to double-stranded DNA, and then they can be made into mRNA. There's a group called the uh, group 3, dsRNA viruses, which are double-stranded RNA. They have a thing called an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which takes that double-stranded RNA and turns it into an mRNA that it can use. Uh, we have plus-stranded single-strand RNA viruses like coronaviruses, again, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase there. Influenza viruses are negative sense single-stranded RNA viruses. So they need to be turned into mRNA, but they also get made into the minus strand again uh, for viral genome replication. Then here's an interesting group. This group is called the retroviruses. Um, this is a group of single-stranded RNA viruses that first converts the RNA into DNA. And it does that with an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. We will see the retroviruses when we talk about HIV. Um, this process then allows the uh, mRNA to be made from the DNA. There's another group, DS DNA viruses, um, that uh, convert to RNA 
and then they reverse transcribe back to double-stranded DNA. Uh, why? Because evolution, right? Things just happen. Um, so these are the seven groups. I do not want you to memorize this. I would like you to understand what these terms mean and how we classify them. Um, so uh, just know that we classify them based on is it DNA or RNA? Or is it double-stranded or single-stranded? Is it plus or minus? Okay, that's our brief overview here. We're going to dive into some of the details in the next section. So remember, viruses are non-cellular particles. We call that uh, virion. They have a genome that will then replicate within the host cell. Uh, given viruses will have a host range that could be very narrow, single species, or could be very broad, many, many species. Uh, and then uh, different viruses have different genome types. Is it DNA or RNA? Is it single-stranded or double-stranded? Is it plus or minus? Okay, that's it for 12.1.